The issue of terrorism has obviously been in the news uh, due to the recent terrorist attacks in Israel. I'm joined now by attorney Chris Paulos. Chris, you have been working uh, for many years at this point on terrorism lawsuits, specifically targeting banks that have uh, essentially been laundering money yep. for terrorists for, for decades at this point. So I, I guess obviously the elephant in the room, we have to talk about this recent attack and, and what we know, uh, if we know anything about any of the, the funding or who might be behind it in addition to Hamas. Yep. Well, I mean, Hamas obviously is a, is a longtime terrorist organization, quasi-political organization uh, in the Middle East. And we do know who finances Hamas and what one of their primary sources of funding is. And that is the, the country, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. And they have been a longtime backer uh, of that group as well as others. Um, and, you know, it is part of their constitutional uh, uh, creation of that of the country, that that particular version of Iran to uh, wage jihad against uh, Israel and, and Western uh, targets, uh, essentially. And so Hamas is one of the arms that they use to do that. And so with Iran, they have been linked, uh, you know, to to attacks, the funding coming from the country. So is it is it the government? of Iran where this is coming from, or, or are they turning a blind eye to it? You know, how, how does the funding mechanism work in those instances? So it is absolute, it's absolutely the, the government of Iran. Uh, they use proxy organizations like Hezbollah, Hamas, Al Qaeda, um, and those that they have you know, some closer operational relationships with, such as Hezbollah and Hamas, or those that they basically provide safe haven funding weapons to and, and let run amok throughout the Middle East or elsewhere and strike secret deals like they did with Al Qaeda, where they would give Al Qaeda safe haven in Iran, allow them to use their financial infrastructure to fund their operations throughout the globe, but didn't really have a, a an obvious connection to that group because of the Shia Sunni divide that that exists. Um, but that's that's how Iran is operating. Their uh, external, essentially military, paramilitary uh, operations are all conducted by foreign terrorist organizations that they've supported with uh, a large amounts of money, weapons, training, you name it. Hamas being, you know, one of the primary groups that they support. And and so obviously this is a, it, it's a very hot button issue whenever you're talking about Israel and Palestine. And, and, you know, you do have issues with what Israel has done in Palestine. But, but right now, this is almost, it, it's related, but it's not quite related, right? Because we're dealing with a terrorist attack. A horrific terrorist attack. I mean, you, you can't look at the footage. You cannot look at the things that have happened and, and justify it. You, you, you cannot. I mean, I know I've seen people on social media that have attempted to, but you cannot. This is not government versus government. This is an extremist group funded by an outside country that has a vested interest in this happening. So people have to understand this different dichotomy that we are dealing with here. And another part of that dichotomy, which you and I have talked about in the past, but we got to talk about it, is the banks. You know, uh, we have seen these banks. And they've even told the Justice Department, we, yeah, we did it. And Justice Department says, that's so mean of you. Pay us some money and we're going to, we're done. So tell us the role that the banks play. How do they fit into the scheme? Yeah, well, um, you know, there's you, there's many uh, many instances of which the leaders of these terrorist organizations um, and officials within Iran or other states sponsored terror, where they they will flatly say that money is the lifeblood of terrorism. That without money, there can be no jihad, um, and there needs to be a, a process established for terrorist organizations to receive funding, distribute funding, and uh, financial infrastructure and banks are what that, what that is. So without the assistance of those types of financial services and that type of infrastructure, terrorist organizations cannot, uh, cannot exist. They cannot operate, they cannot pay uh, folks uh, to participate, they cannot pay bounties, they can't buy weapons, they can't uh, do what is necessary logistically for them to be able to operate uh, around the globe or in particular areas. So with, with banks, unfortunately, there are banks that are willing to turn a blind eye, not do what's required of them in terms of knowing their customers. And in some instances, and in, in, in a lot of the lawsuits that I handle, the banks took affirmative steps 
to hide transactions or to set up special departments or processes for what they call high risk customers, which is a nice way of saying our terrorist, our terrorist customers. So, um, so these groups absolutely need banking infrastructure in order to, to operate. Uh, Iran needs to be able to get US dollar currency or cur you know, you know, that type of money because that's essentially the most accepted currency in, uh, around the globe. And they need to be able to fund these organizations in a way that you know, gives them plausible deniability. And we know that banks around the globe and some with, you know, that are very well known um, have facilitated that. They do that through uh, basically assisting their high risk clients in hiding transactions or moving money through the global economic system to places where that money can then either uh, be used for uh, you know, terrorism, crime or other types of uh, uh, activities that support these groups. So we're talking about the banks doing more than just turning a blind eye, right? They, they, they know, oh, we, we suspected, but we're just, we're not looking in that direction. This is different. This is the banks legitimately helping them to do this, correct? Yeah, so they, uh, you know, banks have an affirmative duty to know who they're banking with, who holds accounts there, who are the beneficiaries of their accounts. And they also have an affirmative duty to report uh, suspicious transactions, illegal transactions, or transactions that, that may be used uh, for criminal activity or illicit purposes. And so they absolutely make the decision not to report certain things or to handle transactions that would be normally reportable. And that's you know affirmative conduct on their part. They have to basically decide not to live up to the standards that uh, the government or regulatory body set for themselves and also the banking industry sets for themselves. So it's, it is active participation in these, in these types of, uh, in this type of conduct. So, so you know, I, I mentioned briefly earlier when the U, uh, U.S. Justice Department they caught the banks doing this. Uh, which bank was that? Because what was it? A two billion dollar fine they paid, I think. Yeah, there's been a, a whole a whole bunch of banks, but the ones that are were probably most widely reported would be HSBC, uh, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank. Uh, you know, these are banks that are are frequently getting fined or you know slapped with a consent order for doing something illegal or facilitating uh, in, you know money laundering or even screwing over their customers in in some respects. Yeah. So. And, and so nobody, nobody in this banking system that, that is a global financial market, none of them have gone to jail for this, ever. No, no. And, and so it, it's part of the cost of doing business because these banks get money off of these transactions, they put it in their pockets, and then finally when they get busted, okay, well, we, we we're going to sanction you with this fine. That fine is never high enough to actually cover the profits that these banks pulled off of this. Absolutely uh, not. Yeah. It, it's the same thing, you know, it doesn't matter if it's if it, we're talking about banks or these, you know, corporations, the drug companies, the corporate polluters, all of them pocket far more than they ever pay out. And, and they know that. It's a calculated risk that they take because they still get this big, huge profit off of it. And has it stopped? I mean, obviously the DOJ looked over their shoulders one time. Has it stopped now? No, absolutely not. I mean, the, uh, they've been, you know, I, I call them recidivist criminal banks. Essentially, they, when they get fined for one type of conduct, they may shut that department down or make, you know, what look like changes to their business operations. But as we see time and time again, they're getting busted for doing something else or finding another way around counterterrorism financing sanctions, money laundering obligations, and, and so forth. It's just, uh, it's a way that they've decided to do business. And like you said, paying these fines or being confronted with a criminal or civil penalty is simply a, a, co a routine cost of business for them. And I do think it's interesting, you know, to kind of bring it back to the terrorism aspect, because, you know, coming of age during, you know, the 9-11 the time, and you hear everything about these terrorists, like it's this unsophisticated group, you know, they, they don't have an apparatus, they're, they're hiding in their caves. I mean, that was the talking point we heard all over the media, they're hiding in their caves, plotting these. That, that's not at all how this works. I mean, no, no. it is far more sophisticated, and I don't want to say then they get credit for, you know, shouldn't give them credit for anything, but I, I, I think the public, as in general, underestimates how 
intricate and sophisticated these networks are. Absolutely, and you know that that does uh, terrorist organizations a favor to consider them, uh, you know, these you know, backwards type folks or these uh, kind of uh, you know just basically unorganized, untalented, unsophisticated groups. That that's essentially playing into their their hand. They prefer to be thought of that way, but we know that. Many of them, if uh, and most certainly the most prolific and active terrorist organizations, are receiving and the backing from state organizations. So you need to assume that they are as sophisticated as any uh, foreign governmental ent entity or state, uh, and have the resources of, of a country behind them. So, Chris, last time you and I spoke, we we talked about an issue that happened right in our hometown of uh, Pensacola, Florida. Uh, so, just to kind of recap that. Uh, we had a, a Saudi Arabian or Saudi national, I guess, uh, who was over here as part of a training. You know, we have this agreement with the uh, Saudi Arabian government. They come here, they do their training, and he comes on our military base one day and he starts opening fire. So where are we? And, and you know, regular viewers here, if you don't remember, go back, look at the interview that I did with Chris Paulos here. Uh, so kind of just give us an update on, on where that one is, because I know at one point wasn't there, you know, you were having to reach out to Congress or I mean. Yeah, so um, the case is still active. Um, we've been, lit been litigating it. Um, not surprisingly, Saudi Arabia denies any wrongdoing and is fighting us tooth and nail uh, to uh, have the case dismissed. Um, we uh, have, you know, maintained the lawsuits to date. Um, the latest kind of turn in the case is uh, the court has asked the Justice Department to chime in. Um, they elected not to file a statement of interest because, and rightfully so, I don't think it uh, is something that should be dealt with by the executive branch or Congress. It's got to be held, uh, these folks got to be held accountable in a court of law and it, it needs to be in the judicial branch. And uh, I think that's the best method for seeking uh, redress for these clients. But you know, when the attack first happened, there was a lot of press about how sorry Saudi Arabia was, how they were going to take care of these families and a lot of lip service that was done. And uh, I think that probably contributed to this kind of falling out of the news cycle. What you hear a lot about is, you know, obviously Khashoggi, Jamal Khashoggi, rightfully so, uh, at Saudi Arabia's sport washing. But people seem to have forgotten what happened just a few years ago in Pensacola at the hands of a officer in the Royal Saudi Air Force and uh, the deaths and destruction that he caused while here in the uniform of that military. Um, and what we know and what we've learned through the, the, the case is that he was a member of Al Qaeda before he ever joined the Saudi military, which obviously should have been flagged by the Saudi military when he signed up. Uh, he was uh, nominated to come to the United States, which was a very uh, rare thing to happen. Very few uh, pilots get nominated to come, and he was active on Twitter uh, and on social media with his extremist views, but still received that nomination. And uh, seemed, he, we believe that he was supported by other Saudis uh, officials and other folks in the Saudi government uh, throughout that time period and leading up to the attack that he committed. Uh, on U.S. soil. Unbelievable. Chris, what you're doing is is so much, I, I think, no offense, I, you know, I love all the lawyers at the firm. It, it, I think it's so much more intense. It's so much more difficult. Uh, you've really been, been given such a hard task with this, but so far you're doing a, an amazing job with it, and I appreciate what you do. I appreciate on behalf of Pensacola what you're doing, and of course, across the globe, what you are doing uh, is just absolutely so helpful. So thank you so much for sitting and talking with us today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Karen.